Words at War. This is a dedication to those politicians, statesmen, and leaders of the world who either actively brought on this war or passively failed to raise a finger to prevent it. To those financiers, bankers, and industrialists who armed fascist Japan while she was in the very act of crushing China and who now, in the midst of war, are still engaged in their slimy imperialist game of obtaining materials for the next war. To those leaders and their henchmen who have twisted this war into what it should not have been, and who today are both consciously and unconsciously betraying the democratic will of the enslaved people of Europe and Asia in hate. And to the soldiers of all nations who are lying on the once good but now mangled and bloodied earth, striving to get at each other's throats, who are staring up at the stars at night, recalling their lost youth and the forgotten days of peace, who are consumed not so much with mutual hatred for each other as with their united hatred for war. In love, this program is dedicated. Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, presents another of the most widely discussed programs in America, Words at War, dramatizing the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. Tonight, still time to die, as told by foreign correspondent Jack Belden. Seven months ago, I was wounded in Italy. I'm only just now recovering from my wound. After the long and tormented years of war, it, it was like a dream fulfilled to lie in a hospital bed. For days, there was the wonderful thrill of tasting and filling up on such simple things as eggs and milk and fruit. There was the excitement of the free press, the moving experience of talking in a loud, unguarded tone without peering through the windows to see if anyone was listening, and the simple knowledge of being free from the slamming racket of war. Then it happened. The world of America came into my hospital room. At first, it came in with the newspapers in an editorial or a sentence by a columnist. Sometimes it came through the door with visitors or a speech by a politician. And after a while, it drove in on me like a flood. This thing, the thing that I abhorred, was in this country. On the radio, I heard... Today, the 8th Army advanced again on all fronts, sweeping enemy resistance. It was a victorious army, fighting gloriously with a determination that only American boys have, giving the enemy blow for blow, staggering him with every exchange, waiting for that moment when they can deliver the knockout punch. In the theaters, in the newsreels, I saw and heard... And now we see the American heavy guns in action, blasting away at the enemy. The little boys are carrying out the job with utmost precision, like the veteran fighters that they are. Yes, sir. You can't be Johnny Doughboy when it comes to fighting. They can take it, and they can dish it out. In Washington, high-ranking officials elected by the people were saying, I say it's unfair to my constituents to ask them to forego their cars for the duration. I tell you, the American people won't stand for it. We have plenty of gasoline. Why, then? Must the OPA interfere with our constitutional rights of driving cars on American highways? War or no war, we're not going to let the OPA get away with it. And all this time, the hero in the motion picture was telling the girl back home... Gee, honey, it's nice to be home. I'm glad you are home, honey. You weren't worried, were you, honey? Gosh, no, honey. We all knew you could take care of those Japs. Oh. What's the matter, honey? Those metals on your chest sure are sharp, aren't they? <laughs> but I don't mind. After all, you're my hero, honey. You see what I'm driving at? These people did not know the meaning of war. 
did not know the meaning of the struggle raging throughout the world. War was a remote, adventurous episode. The moving of pins on a map, the glib voice of a commentator, the smugness of an orator. When I heard these things, my heart was torn asunder. And out of the tears gushed up a stream of bitter memories. I had to tell the people what the war was all about. I had to tell the truth. Listen to me now. It isn't just to shock you that I say these things. It's to make you understand, to, to make you realize that we're not immune to the dangers we see abroad. We may be next. Our turn might come tomorrow, unless we stop repeating the mistakes of other nations, because war may be remote one moment, and the next it is in your home, in your living room, ripping away at your flesh. Stop then and think. What war does to blood and bone and living tissue? To begin with, what is war? War is hell. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Familiar and trite, a cliché. But what exactly does it mean? What picture flashes through your mind when you read the latest communique from the front? What, for instance, does this sentence mean, taken from the seventh sporting final? A communique buried on the bottom of the second page, printed in bold letters against the dateline, July 15th. Japs outflank Chinese troops moving north. Let me repeat that. Japs outflank Chinese troops moving north. Now, what do you see? Cold print, words upon a page. What do you see? Two pins, one yellow, one black, a jagged line across a map. Or do you see this? They are coming! The Japs are coming! Run for your life! But how can we go? We have no money. We have no automobiles. Not even buses. The death of a city comes suddenly. One day the enemy is miles away and there is hope of resistance. The next he is pounding at the gates and panic seizes the populace. In the city everything is in motion. Tired men, tired faces, tired feet. People moving aimlessly through the streets, saying nothing, just moving. The rich have gone a long time ago, on railways, in carts, on trucks. But the poor remain. And then the bombardment comes. I was in the midst of a crowd in the city of Su Chow staring at a fire. The walls of a house gave way before the licking flames and the roof crashed in. Suddenly a voice called out, Look at the old wife! Look at the old wife! She is there, in the building! A woman was caught in a square of fire between three burning houses. Her dark hair hung over her face and she looked like a witch, first running to the flames and then jumping back. She went to look for her child. Hey, tell her to get out of there! Oh, yes, old yes. wife! Come out! Come out! You'll be burned to death! The woman ran around in a circle once and like a rabbit darted through the small opening between the houses. She was distorted and ugly. Stop! Stop, old woman! Somebody! Stop her! Stop her! Don't run, old woman! You are on fire! Why does she stop? The woman was running down the street screaming. Her body was on fire and she was screaming. And the people were running after her. I was in the outskirts of Su Chow, and I was walking with the chief of staff when we came across a peasant. He was running around a tree. He was running around and around, and the sight of the scene was both horrible and fantastic. It seemed impossible that the peasant could keep up his dizzy circuit. Devils. Two devils. They came, and now there shall be no soup. No What's soup. the matter with him, General? I he must be crazy. Hey! Side. Old countryman. Good evening, master. Can you tell us where Lilo is? Are you out for a walk? Uh -huh. Yes. And you? Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, we are out on a walk. We are walking to Lilo. Are we on the right road? No. I am not out for a walk. I am looking at the fields. Beautiful fields. Hmm. So full of things. Wheat. Birds. And devils. Madmen, all of them, these peasants of ours. Come down. What is the matter the with sky. these people? Listen. Old countryman. Where is Lilo? The eastern ocean men have come. Oh, they have come. He does oh, not hear me. My daughter and my wife. 
I went back and couldn't find them. Couldn't find who? My daughter and my wife. I couldn't find them. Two big birds. Oh, oh, two big birds come. And now, this evening, there is no soup. These words came out of a human merry-go-round. The two big birds had taken away his wife and daughter, and they had taken away his mind. God, I thought, is this the world we live in? Is this the tree? Is this the sand? Is this the sky? What blind alley will I come to next? The general took me on a tour, and we visited a village recently occupied by the Japanese. The village was deserted and ghostly. Many of the houses were burned down, and a stomach-turning odor fouled the air. We went into a half-burned house, and I saw a naked girl upon a bed. Two gashes ran across her stomach like dark brown welts. Her face was bashed in, but her mouth had frozen wide open. You see, Mr. Belden, that is how the Japanese make war. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move, but kept staring at the mutilated form on the bed. I was sick with fear and horror. Each day the planes came earlier. Su Chao was being destroyed slowly, systematically. The shrieks of falling bombs, the frightened screams of children, the ghastly moans of dying women filled the air. In the outskirts of the city, a young girl was picking the coarse leaves from a tree. I stared at her. What's the matter, foreigner? I'm... I'm wondering why you're picking these leaves. Can it be for medicine? For food, to eat. How strange. Do you really eat leaves? Of course. There is nothing else to eat. But the grain you planted. Last year's is all gone. And this year's is not yet ripe. There's nothing else to eat. So we eat the leaves. Later, a peasant told me. Why are we forced to eat leaves? Let me tell you. We cannot get credit for seed. The officials and the banks and the merchants who have the cash are gone. And the landlords who have reserves of grain sell it to the army. They don't care if we starve. Are you fighting in the war of resistance? Ah, war of resistance. Huh. Resistance for what? So we can starve. It is the rich who have something to resist for. But they are not suffering too greatly for it either. But you will fight. When they come here, when the Japanese come here, you... You just won't stand by. I uh, don't know. All I know is those with money give a little, yes. But it isn't their money. And it isn't life. For the poor, there's nothing left but, but death. The peasant had stopped speaking. And the grisly events of the China War trooped in weird procession through my brain. A young man losing his mother. The smell of opium. A taste of bombed horse meat. Peasants executed and traitors enthroned in high places. And then I looked at the half-written message on my typewriter. It read, Japs outflank Chinese troops moving north. I got up to all the men. The shells were flying over the city. The crowd was milling about desperately, and the airplanes dropped their bombs. Around the east station, there was not a clean spot to be seen, only blood, house wreckage, trash, bomb splinters. An early summer wind blew the smell of the dead and dying along the street. Three hours later, Suchow was a dead city. The streets were deserted. Not a dog barked. In the plains beyond Suchow, the people gathered for the trek inland. But there were those who remained to fight the enemy. And among them I saw... <laughs> the peasant who said he would not fight. Did 
Did this happen only in China? Hardly. Falseness is a product of any battle. In Malta, Africa, Sicily, Italy, the pattern repeated itself. And to America, the news of war came like a dream. Terse communiques and newsreels showing only a victorious army marching ahead. Only the enemy was dead. Tonight, Words at War is bringing you another vital book of our times. Jack Belden, Still Time to Die. We are now entering the 14th year of war, if we include the people of Manchuria. The 8th, if we include the people of China and Spain. The 6th, if we think it concerned only Europe. And the conclusion of the 3rd year for the people of America. During all this time, how many of us have stopped to think what a battlefield means to the fighting men? How it feels to be wounded? What it means to live in fear? To see a city bombed? Your home destroyed? Your women raped and your children starved? Listen tonight and find out as Jack Belden continues with his narrative. In the hospital room where I lay wounded, the nurse turned up the radio and I heard the voice of a man speaking about the war. The analyst, for that's what he claimed to be, knew all the answers. He had analyzed the whole thing with little pins and sketches. His head was whirling with maps and arrows and shaded lines, and what he said was very good, very inspiring, and very cockeyed. The battle for the Mediterranean... It is the little island of Malta which stands out like a gleaming jewel in the military history of the world. In those dark days when the skies were black with enemy planes, it was plucky little Malta which stood alone and faced the enemy with unshaken courage and determination. It was the Maltese people who flung their challenge at the sky and dared to be conquered. You want to know what really happened in Malta? All right, then. Listen. In the spring of 1942, Malta was a shambles. An average of 175 bombers swept over our island every day. On April 7th alone, one million pounds of bombs were dropped by invading planes. The food situation was desperate. Rations were issued every fortnight. A can of bully beef and a can of smoked herring between two people every two weeks. In Valletta, 75% of the houses were knocked down. During the blitzes, all social life ceased. The life centered around sleeping and eating. We lived underground. There was no warm clothing, no soap, no transportation. A jewel in military history, you say? It was a sordid, dirty mess, that's what it was. A bloody mess. Plucky little Malta? No. Just a tired little island. Tired and bombed out and full of misery and despair. A former ACAC gunner took me over to Isola Point. We went into a narrow, dark cavern tunneled out of the side of a cliff. In the light of a candle, I saw a line of dirty slat boards hung one above the other against the dank wall. We paused before one of these dirty, smelling slat beds. Mother and daughter and two sons sleep in this bed. The mother had tuberculosis. When it rains, the water leaks down. I went to the officials and told them about her. You know what they said to me? Tell her if she wants to keep dry, to buy an umbrella. We went outside again and I saw a group of women with long, webby hair hanging down over emaciated faces. The gunner pointed to one of them. See that one? She's supposed to get oranges because she's pregnant. When she goes to get them, the rations officer says, get them next week. Always next week. But she never gets them. And look at these kids. He was pointing at a horde of bony children dressed in one-piece rags. Look at them. Not a pretty sight, are they? Well, it was decided to give a feast for the children on the island. You think these children were invited? No. They want children who are dressed up to date. These children have got no clothing. They can't go to the feast. But why not? In heaven's name, why not? Why not? Because they're not wanted, that's why. They can't even go to school. They won't keep them in school unless they've got clean shoes and clean clothes. I try and do something, and it's no good. I talk to the officials like I talk to you, and they say, agitator. Me, agitator. We came to a rubble barrier and suddenly emerged on a street corner. On a curbstone sat a young woman. Her legs were bare, her shoes torn, and her 
Her skin was covered with sores on her arms and neck. I had my notebook and pencil in my hand. Rations? What? She wants to know when the rations are going to be increased. <laughs> she thinks you're an official. Oh. Well, the rations will be increased when the war is over, I guess, ma'am. Why... Why does a pretty girl like you sit on a curbstone like this? Got nothing to do. Where's your husband? He's working in the dockyards in Alexandra. I haven't seen him for three years. What's the matter with your skin? Scabies. Scabies. She gets those from the bombing. Every time there's a bombing, she gets sick in her house and sores come out. Two other women had appeared mysteriously. They clustered about us. When will the government bring clothing? And lipstick. Lipstick. I have a son. You must bring shoes and baby clothing, not lipstick or rouge. Only shoes and clothing. Bring me blue. I want a nice no. dress. I want stockings. My name is Evelyn Mitzi, and the number of my house is 51. Put that down, too. Put that no. down. Get the lipstick. Nightgown. Give me the a nightgown. Shoes. I want shoes. Shoes. Baby clothing. Those were the people of Malta, united in a firm determination to fight the enemy, yes, but mainly united in misery and despair and dirt and squalor and hunger for a better life. And now another voice came into my hospital room, and it was the most sinister voice of all, because it was the voice of the people looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, believing what they wanted to believe. I tell you, the end of the war is now in sight. Mussolini is on the run. Soon our armed forces will sweep onto fortress Europe and on the road to Berlin. Simple, isn't it? Sweep onto forest Europe on the road to Berlin. But the road to Berlin is a two-way highway. Both victory and defeat can travel on it side by side. And in death, there is little distinction between the two. We were on the way to invade Salerno. As I groped unsteadily along the deck, a nameless sinking feeling welled within me. The soldiers were clinging to the stanchions and holding on to ladders, and even in the distance, their faces seemed tense and greenish. Suddenly, a voice beside me yelled, Hey, there's a man overboard. Yeah, right over there. Cripes, to jump overboard at a time like this, a guy must be yellow. If he was yellow, he wouldn't jump overboard. He was probably sick and fell over the side and fell in. Couldn't they pick him up? Couldn't they at least pick him up? Do you think this fleet's a taxi? If a guy wants to get off here before we get to Salerno, that's his own lookout. Well, probably would have got it at the beach anyway. Come on, get out. Come on, boys, get out. Our duck hit the beach and we vaulted to the ground. Barbed wire clutched us. Cut the wire. The wire was cut and we moved on. Over a railway embankment, into a garden, down a narrow cement irrigation ditch, through a lemon grove. Keep moving, come on, keep moving. Oh, now the hill. Going straight up. Climbing in a column with a man ahead of you, stepping on your hands. Men weak from diarrhea, from exhaustion, from fever. And then your chest bones swelling from the climbing. Your breath crushing out of you and your strength ebbing away at the very moment when you have to go into battle. And then, sniper's bullets and men falling dead at your feet. But you crouch and keep climbing. Higher, higher, over the rocky pinnacle, over the top of the hill, onto a narrow plateau. You've made it. I was crawling behind the wall, and I came abreast of the truck door. I made my way beyond the front of the truck and looked over the stones. Something like a baseball bat hammered into my leg. A cloud of darkness enveloped me, and a great weight pushed my leg into the ground, and the leg swelled and puffed and tried to push off the weight. And then suddenly there was blackness. The next day I was on a hospital ship. There was a fellow in the bunk below with a bullet in his spine and he couldn't move. On one side of me was a boy from Texas with a bullet in his stomach and he couldn't eat. The ship was attacked by dive bombers and listening to the thud of the underwater explosions, we wondered what would happen if we started sinking. A sailor came into our bunk. I'm so mad, I'm never going to believe a commentator or newspaper guy again. What have I done now? Eh, not you. You're just a dumb guy who gets himself wounded. But I just heard the radio say that correspondents report that the Italians lit up the beach for us. And we stormed ashore under cover of a heavy bombardment against the Germans. And everything looked like Coney Island. I got mad. I'm still so mad, I feel like crying. 
I'm mad because I heard another voice just now. A pompous, spatuous voice, smug and satisfied. A voice coming from a man with no conception of the thing we're fighting for and against. This man said to me, Well, my friend, I guess it's all over but the shouting. Pretty soon we'll be in Berlin. And that'll be the end of fascism. Yes, the thing that I abhorred was in this country, too. For while the glib tongues wagged about the end of fascism throughout the world, I found it here, right in the United States. Bold, loud, repellent, and widespread. It was everywhere, even in the hospital. It was a nurse who said to me one day... I'm sorry I couldn't get to you sooner, honey. But those dirty foreigners get in my hair. If you ask me, we ought to send them back where they came from. It was on the floor of Congress. Listen closely to this list of names. Letters protesting a speech I made. Lifshitz, Schwartz, Rivkin, Goldstein, Moskowitz. Well, where I come from, they call them kites. <laughs> and it was the well-bred country club voice who said, There's only one way we can live in peace with the Japanese people, and that is by keeping the emperor in power in Japan after the war. <laughs> So it was after ten years of wandering and war that I was furnished proof of what I'd known for a long time. That the world was all of one piece. That America, like all the rest, was sick with a dread world sickness of the soul. America, because she's a wealthy country, was getting her fascism late. The land was pregnant with reaction. Then... Has all this fighting been in vain? Has all this bloodshed and misery been futile and pointless? I hope not. I hope the people will open their eyes and see and realize what this war is about. I hope they will go forward instead of backward. I hope they will discover the new democracy of the world. That's why I've told you my story. Time is flowing by now. I'm going back into battle. And they hear far off the buzzsaw roar of the plains. And we who once retreated advance again. There may not be time to live in freedom, but there is time to fight for it. There is still time to die. Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you Jack Belden, Still Time to Die. The radio dramatization was written by Ben Kagan. Walter Vaughn was heard as Jack Belden. The music was arranged and played by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of Rex Warner's Return of the Traveler. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm.